Hello, Radix community. Uh, I wanted to do a little video here to talk about the Radix Engine V2. Uh, this is something we've mentioned in the DeFi white paper that we've published, and we've been talking to our community about it quite a bit uh, recently. Um, this is one of the key parts of our, our focus on building the first layer one protocol that's specifically designed for DeFi. Um, even though it's it's early stages in developing the Radix Engine V2, um, I wanted to give everyone a, a feeling for why we think it's so important and why we think it's going to be so valuable for people that are trying to build DeFi applications that are intended for mainstream adoption rather than just the early stuff that we've go got going on right now. So I've got a little slide deck that I want to go through here. Um, and I'm going to split this into two parts. The first part is going to be talking, generally speaking, about what is the Radix Engine 2? Generally speaking, what does this thing really mean? What, how does it fit into the solution? Uh, and then in the second video that I'm going to do as a follow-on, uh, this will talk in a little bit more detail about how exactly it works um, and what's so interesting about it. Um, so I'm going to get started here. So. Radix Engine V2 is a, is a more secure, intuitive form of smart contracts intended for DeFi. So they, the first part of the video here I want to talk about is what exactly is that and, and what's so great about it. Um, to begin with, you can think of the Radix Engine, generally speaking, as a new way of building decentralized applications that's purpose-built for the needs of DeFi. Now, now, what exactly do we mean by that? Obviously, DeFi applications today are generally smart contracts and web apps that people are using on mostly the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and Radix is proposing a, a different way of going about this that has some pretty significant advantages. So to explain what the Radix Engine is, I want to start by talking about, from a developer's perspective, what does Ethereum development look like today? What does their solution stack look like? And it looks a little bit like this. You have essentially two different kinds of developer. Now, in a lot of cases, this is you know, one person, that's fine, but there's kind of two different kinds of development that goes in any application. There's the, the back-end developer uh, and then the front-end developer. What I mean by that is the back-end developer is the one that's actually building the smart contracts. They use Solidity code. Um, and they're writing the fundamental decentralized part of the, of the application that's running on the Ethereum ledger. Uh, whereas the front-end developer is writing typically like a, you know, a front-end application like a, a mobile app or a web app, which knows how to interact with those smart contracts on letter, ledger, but is running off ledger. So if you think about Uniswap as an overall decentralized application, uh, you have the Uniswap smart contracts, which are running the letter, ledger, which is performing the liquidity providing and the swaps and all these sorts of things. And then you have what you see when you go to uniswap.org, uh, which is your front end that you connect Meta, MetaMask to and so forth like that. So the back end developer is building the smart contracts and the front end developer is building some kind of app that is using those smart contracts. And the, the interface to a smart contract is what, what's called a method. So it's pretty simple. Smart contract gets written, deployed to the ledger. That smart contract runs on what's called the EVM or the Ethereum virtual machine. This is kind of like the, almost like a hardware layer thing. That's, that it, it knows how to run Solidity code. And then in the end, that's being uh, committed to the Ethereum ledger through the Nakamoto style consensus mechanism that Ethereum uses today. OK, so pretty simple. The Radix version of this for for Radix Engine V2, and and again, this is this is not the 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 uh, the, the initial form of the Radix ledger that we're going to be deploying, but uh, the the release that's going to come later that implements Radix Engine V2 is going to look quite a bit like this. Um, a little bit more complicated, but kind of of the same form. So again, we've got back end developers and front end developers, but we've added some new things here. So. Now, um, now we're we're doing something called we're creating component blueprints using scripto code. Scripto is our, is the the specialized um, smart contract programming language that we built, uh, and in fact, we're using this word component rather than smart contract. Um, it's a similar concept, but components are fairly unique. So we've got this idea of creating the components and, and creating blueprints for those components, instantiating, and then using those components, and then we've got these other internal pieces here that make all that possible. I'm not going to explain all these bits right now. This is a very complex view, and you're going to understand this a little bit more once I get later in the presentation. But for now, it's best to just understand that we've got some new things that a developer can do, and these are all enabled by the Radix Engine V2, which I'm just, it's sort of wrapping around these variety of components we have that ultimately sit on top of our unique consensus mechanism that we call Cerberus. OK. So why does that matter? What's so great about the Radix Engine V2? All this stuff that we're building here, what does it actually give a developer? And there are two major features, you could say, that we give a developer with this. 
The first is the component blueprint catalog. Um, this is a, it's an interesting difference with Ethereum. So let's look at the life cycle of, of building and deploying a smart contract. Uh, on Ethereum, it looks kind of like this. You write Solidity code, you deploy that Solidity code to the network and it becomes a smart contract. So you might have a, you know, there's a token A, a token B, a price oracle, um, all these different smart contracts are deployed individually as sort of separate uh, in, uh, um, independent pieces of Solidity code, and each one of those is running separately on the Ethereum ledger. Now, of course, they can they can talk to each other, which is uh, the the Lego brick com uh, composability that is very interesting for DeFi. But um, everything is deployed in this fairly straightforward manner. Radix is a little bit different. Um, the typical lifestyle on Radix is that you have scripto code that is deployed to what we call the blueprint catalog. Um, blueprints are are not the same thing as an active smart contract. You, you wouldn't directly interact with a blueprint. It really is more of a template uh, for functionality. So someone might deploy crypto code that expresses the general idea of a token or a price oracle, and then someone else can come in and instantiate. They can, they can say, ah, I like that blueprint. I want a token that uses that blueprint, or I want an oracle that uses that blueprint. And in fact, we have this idea of importing, which also allows you to take a blueprint and then add something new to that blueprint to elaborate the functionality. So there's a little bit more of a, a little bit more of a, a mature life cycle here, where um, you have more reusability and so forth. So, what does this actually give you as a developer? Well, this is primarily focused on that backend developer who's creating on ledger functionality. Uh, and the difference here, to to make a kind of a silly metaphor, is doing it on Ethereum is kind of like being a medieval scribe. Uh, every time you're, if you want to write a smart contract, what you're doing is you have to write out the code that you want into your own book, and that book becomes you put it on the shelf, and now this is a smart contract that someone else can read. Um, and anytime you want to do something, you have to go through that manual process of writing your own code. Now, you might choose, you might say, oh, well, I just, I want to, I want a token just like someone else's token. So what you do is you pull their book off the shelf and you manually copy it down. It's literally copy pasting code um, saying, yes, this is, this is, I want to do a smart contract that looks like this. But from the ledger's point of view, it might, you might as well have written it from scratch. It doesn't know the difference. You are just copying code and then deploying it yourself and it's completely independent. The Radix approach is a little bit more like a printing press. Uh, we have this idea of blueprints, and you can create many copies of things from blueprints, and then you can modify the blueprints, like I said. So the result of this is that you have more options as a developer. Uh, you can choose to purely instantiate an existing blueprint. If you if someone has already written a piece of functionality that fundamentally does what you need, and you just need to um, input a few parameters that they've provided, you can just instantiate that from an existing blueprint. There's no code required to do that. You can just do that using the Radix library um, and basically make a call to say, I want one of those. Um, the next option is you can add to an existing blueprint. Um, you can import someone else's blueprint and you can write some of your own scripto code to add to functionality to that. So for example, maybe there's a token that you like, but you say, I want a token, but I want my token to add this, this extra bit of, of utility that the, the base token doesn't have. Great, you can just add that on rather than having to re-implement from scratch. Then the last thing is, of course, you can create from scratch, just like on Ethereum if you want to. If you've got something that is so unique that no one has done anything at all that you can make use of, you can write it all uh, from scratch using Scripto. And Scripto is a very expressive, fully functional language that allows you to write um, more or less arbitrary uh, functionality just like you get on Ethereum. Now the language itself is quite different, and how it how it is how it runs and how and how you use it as a developer is quite different. But I'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, so that's the first advantage. In the end, here what you have is a is a is more of a a, a an ecosystem of code that's much more modular and much more secure because you don't constantly have people trying to re-implement the same uh, the same thing over and over again and potentially making mistakes. If there's a secure piece of of component code, you can reuse that and be be confident that it's going to work just like it has for everyone else. And you only have to implement what it is that you really care about as a developer. It's very powerful. Okay. The second piece of big advantage that this approach gives the developer um, is the difference between smart contracts and Radix components. They do they operate quite differently, even though they, in the end, allow you to do things in a decentralized way on the ledger, the approach is pretty different. So again, I'll compare to Ethereum here. 
the Ethereum approach looks kind of like this. And I'm going to use the example again of, of a token. So um, I'm sure anyone watching this video is familiar with the ERC-20 token smart contract standard. This is, again, it's kind of like a holy book that's sitting on the shelf that people set. Many people have built a token using this smart contract, so people tend to pull that off the shelf and copy it and make their own that's that's compatible with that same, that same uh, template. But it's all done off ledger. So in an ERC-20 token, the way in which it creates token-like behavior is by maintaining a list of balances inside what's basically a black box. Uh, the ERC-20 smart contract has some logic that allows uh, a user to use some methods. So there might be a send method. So someone says, I want to send 10 tokens from my account to Bob. But what's hand happening under, the, under the, the hood there is that it's reducing my balance of tokens by 10, and it's increasing Bob's balance of tokens by 10. It's just sort of changing this internal record. It's all in this, this island. It's all in this black box within that individual smart contract. Um, it's, it's not a universal thing. And this is a little bit counterintuitive. I think a lot of people that, um, you know, if, you're, if you bring up your Ethereum wallet, and let's say you've got uh, a dozen different ERC-20 tokens in your wallet, um, it isn't as if those tokens are all actually sort of stored in your account. What's actually happening is your wallet is going out talking to a dozen different ERC-20 contracts and asking each one of those contracts, what's my balance here? What's my balance here? What's my balance here? And presenting you a view of all those balances. Um, in some ways, it's kind of like interacting with banks, which is a little bit ironic. Um, the Radix way of doing a token is quite a bit different. Here, each token is its own independent sort of uh, uh, you know, sovereign entity, if you will. Um, a, com a token component acts more like a physical thing rather than being just represented by a numerical balance on a, on a balance sheet inside a black box. If you think of a supply of tokens, let's say there's a total number of, of 100 tokens, in Radix's case, there actually are 100 of these individual little what we call finite state machines. It's basically a little piece of, it's, it's a little piece of independent code and each one of those things has its own behavior. And for a token, that behavior is change owner. Um, the way in which a front end app would use this is, is it would talk to, it would essentially send a message to that token, say, hey, token, I own you right now. Therefore, I have the right to tell you to change your owner to Bob. Now, this is quite a bit different, but I think the important thing here is this acts a lot more like something physical, something intuitive. If I'm paying Bob in the real world, I'm pulling the, my wallet out of my pocket, I possess a dollar bill, and I'm physically handing that dollar bill to, to Bob. Only one of us can own it at one time. When I hand it to him and he takes it, it automatically changes ownership. So you can say that, in a way, the, the feature of a dollar bill is this is a physical thing that only has one owner at one time. Well, that's exactly what we're doing at the component here. A, a token component is something that is defined by the fact that only one person can own it at a time. So a supply of tokens is just lots of those. And we can have a sort of a higher level of definition that says, OK, here's how you create all these tokens. All these tokens behave in the same way. They're all part of the same supply. They have the same name and all this kind of stuff. So a very different approach. So why is this so important? Well, this is more important for the front end developer. This is the person that's using on ledger, ledger functionality. Uh, from their point of view, if I'm if I want to, if I'm just building a front end application, I, I just want to interact with a bunch of tokens or with a bunch of applications and use their functionality. On Ethereum, building that front end app is kind of like interacting with a bunch of these little bookkeepers. Um, each black box is like a bookkeeper, and it's keeping its own little internal record that it keeps private and won't show it to anybody else unless you ask them nicely. Um, and if you want to interact, if you want to compose um, functionality across multiple smart contracts, like many DeFi applications, you have to talk to all these individual bookkeepers, or it might be that you talk to one bookkeeper, and then behind that is the scenes that bookkeeper turns around, and he calls up four other bookkeepers and talks to them. And in the end, all the book list bookkeepers are making updated entries in their individual little ledgers, and that is the result of what happens. The problem with this is it's pretty complicated to predict what's going to happen there, um, and, and it's very it's very opaque. Um, it's it's hard to tell if I'm talking to one bookkeeper. It's a little bit hard to tell exactly what he's going to be talking to other bookkeepers about and what the result is going to be on all of their different little internal ledgers. The Radix approach is a little bit different because we have this notion of building things that act intuitively, that that act and that are defined in terms of the way they should behave. Radix engine components operate a little bit more like something like a gumball machine. 
uh, a gumball machine is something where you know you've got a quarter that acts like a quarter you've got a machine that knows how to, to distribute gumball and you've got gumball that sort of is just this physical thing that can exist in one place or another so this means that the it's much more predictable you're not going to find out that you put a quarter into a gumball machine and suddenly five quarters come out of it that's it simply can't happen because that's not in the definition of a quarter a quarter is something that has to exist in one place or another and same thing your gumball machine that can be something that can be defined in terms of saying i will only i will only output a piece of gumball if there is a quarter that's been inserted it's very physical, it's very intuitive. And this, this means that you get much more predictable behavior and it avoids a lot of the, the problems and a lot of the exploits we've seen in, the, in DeFi today where money gets lost because of complex behavior that was difficult to predict. Okay, so those are the two main benefits of this approach at a very, very high level. And of course, you're asking if you're, if you're certainly if you're a developer and, and even someone that's just, uh, you know, uh, that's understands how DeFi works, you might be saying, well, this sounds great, but how actually does this work? Um, you know, how is it that you create this physical behavior? You know, why isn't Ethereum doing this already if it's so great? Well, that gets into the next part of my presentation, which is how did Radix Engine V2 work? Um, this is going to go into a little bit more detail. So I'm going to pause here. Um, if you're, if you're satisfied, great, you can move on. If you'd like to understand a little bit more technical detail, you can go ahead and, and click to the next part of this video. Thanks.